hi, hey, hello. It's probably been a good like 10 months since you guys have last seen me um, or that I've last posted a video. Also, like, look how tan I am. Don't look at my tan line though. Don't look at that. Just look how tan I am. I'm in college now. I'm a film major. <laughs> I've actually filmed quite a lot of YouTube videos since that eight months ago when the last time I posted was and I've just had such a hard time like editing them and like getting them out there and I never have any motivation and I just don't really want to do it and I realize it's because I'm not passionate about some of those videos I was posting and maybe in the weeks to come I will post fun videos but right now I want to post things that I actually care about. Um, and one thing that I care about is telling you guys about my journey of getting rid of my anxiety. This is not formal medical advice, I am not a doctor, and also I was never formally diagnosed with any kind of anxiety disorder. This is just kind of me sharing my experience. Now that that's taken out of the way, so let's take it all the way back to my childhood. So I have always been, I guess, like an anxious child. I feel like I worried about a lot of things. My parents always kind of got on my ass, like, you need to stop worrying about things, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I obviously, as a 10-year-old, didn't know what anxiety was. Like, for example, I would be just, like, pacing around in my kitchen before, and I loved school. I had, like, the best friends, like, I loved learning. I loved school. It wasn't like I was, like, getting bullied at school or something. I loved school, but I would just be so anxious to go every morning, and I could only eat, like, yogurt for an extended period of time because it was the only food that didn't make my stomach hurt and I just like go to school and I feel so anxious but I didn't know it was anxiety at the time and my friends and I would be playing tag and I'd just be like Ugh. like I feel like the need to like gag and I'm like what so that was like a childhood thing and then there were some other things that would make me like directly anxious like flying or like traveling in general because I used to get really bad motion sickness and I remember so vividly the first panic attack I ever had was actually during airport security with my family and I was just like, oh my god, what is happening to me right now? I was probably like 12. Then going into kind of high school, I started learning about anxiety and I was like, shit, <laughs> I think I have that. A lot of you guys might have seen my documenting breakup video and during that I kind of talked about my mental health and how, you know, the breakup exacerbated it. But what I didn't disclose in that video was that my mental health was really really bad before the breakup um which made the breakup worse and my mental health after the breakup was also really really bad if not worse than it was before the breakup um and i felt so not worthless but like distraught that the person who like i loved and supported i felt like they couldn't love and support me in my time of need in my like mental lowness and obviously growing up, it's been years since that video, since that relationship. And I, number one, like we were literally little kids when that happened and you know, whatever, that's irrelevant. But my main point is I did not disclose my mental health at that time. And it was, yes, I was really, really sad about the breakup, but there was a lot of other things going on that I didn't talk about in that video. So that's what we're here to do today. So going back to that time, I think it was 20, 2020 to 2020. 21. I'm just gonna go over kind of like the things that I experienced and like the symptoms that I had. One thing was that I had, sorry, I have like all this written out in my notes. Oh wow, you, oh, can't see anything, okay. Um, <laughs> one thing that I had was really, really bad intrusive thoughts. Um, and I tell people this story now and it's like kind of funny, but at the time it was not funny at all. I'm sitting in a Black Rock coffee shop or whatever, or I'm outside the, in the parking lot. And I go to back up my car and I like hit a curb. I'm an excellent driver, okay, but I hit a curb, okay. So I pull away, I'm like, okay, whatever. And then I start thinking, the cogs start turning. And I'm like, what if what I hit wasn't a curb? What if that was a person? And so the whole day at school, I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God, I hit a person. I'm gonna be charged with murder. There's probably cameras and I just left. I didn't even help them. It's gonna be a hit and run and blah, 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 blah. Like literally just planning my demise of me going to prison for a hit and run. I'm like, you know what I can do to solve this? I can go back to the Black Rock and I can verify 
because I'm, I'm obviously a logic person, you know, I can verify that there's a curb right there. So what did I do straight after school? Drove my ass back to that black rock and I verified, hey, there is a curb here. Yes, I'm not going to prison. Oh my God, this is awesome. So this cycle continued um, for a couple of months of me having these like extreme intrusive thoughts and then having to like verify them. Because again, logic. At the same time, I also had like the bodily feelings of anxiety, like the like tightness and like tingling of my chest, like the uneasy feeling that something bad was gonna happen to me. Um, just like the actual like chemical body experience of it, as well as like the anxious thoughts, which anxious thoughts tied into the body experience and bodily experience tied into the thoughts of something bad was gonna happen. It was a vicious cycle, obviously. When you are feeling anxious all the time, your appetite is really low. And so I wasn't eating enough to sustain myself. And I was also like super active still. And this like was not intentional. I wasn't intentionally not eating. It was like literally just like I did not feel hungry. And my dad one day was like, you're so thin. Not in like a mean way, but in like a damn, like he, he or no one else really knows until now because they've just been around me, but like you're really, really thin. And like, I've been thin my whole life, but like this was like, to a point where it wasn't healthy. And even like one of my coaches was like, was all that weight loss intentional? And I was like, no, <laughs> cause I didn't even notice. I just wasn't eating, I wasn't hungry. And so then that kind of made me realize like, fuck, I am not in a good mental health space. And kind of throughout this time period, like I knew that like I wasn't in a good mental health space and it kind of just kept declining and declining and declining until then with the weight thing and like some other stuff, I was like, this is not sustainable. Honestly, if I don't get out of this right fucking now, like the repercussions are gonna be, it basically like was unlivable the way I was living. Like I literally was, if, how do I even explain this? Let's say that like I was with my friends or something and we were all laughing. The laughing would feel like a reprieve, but then like in split seconds it was over and I was just like closed in to my little area again. I really don't know how to articulate it. Everything just felt like dampened around me. Like music just felt, it was just sound, you know? I didn't have any connections to anything like emotionally, like I was really numb to everything. And even when I was happy, it would last for like a split second and then it would just be like, whoosh. you know, I don't know. If anyone has ever experienced like any depression or anxiety, I'm sure you can kind of relate to what I'm talking about, but it's like a mask over you. So I obviously started eating more. <laughs> um, that was the first thing. I started like getting into self-help books. I really wanted to go to therapy, but it wasn't possible at that time. Uh, so I got all these like self-help books. I'm a person that if I have a problem, I like attack it head on, you know? Like I'm like, okay, what am I gonna do to fix this? So I read this book, didn't help. I realized it wasn't my self-esteem that was the problem. It was my anxious and intrusive thoughts. So the anxiety and phobia workbook. This is basically a textbook referencing things from the DSM and solutions on how to get over it. So this was pretty helpful, but I still was like, okay, that was a lot of fucking words, bro. Like I analyzed it, I, you know, put it up here, but I'm not, I'm not feeling it. Then I decided to read I don't have it because I did an audiobook version of it. Um, this book, Feeling Good. And this book honestly was my catalyst for, I don't want to say changing my life because I feel like that's so dramatic, like changing my life. But honestly, yeah. My camera battery literally just fucking died and I had to charge it for like half an hour, <laughs> half an hour because I don't have another camera battery. Anyways, where were we? Ugh. So annoying. I had my whole train of thought. Now it's just messed up. The Book Feeling Good by Dr. David Burns. This book is like a combination of that anxiety book, but it's more informal. 
So it's a bit more conversational. It is cognitive behavioral therapy. And here's a definition of that. My definition of cognitive behavioral therapy is basically, <laughs> I haven't even thought about this, basically learning how to recognize your cognitive distortions or illogical thoughts and then being able to change them and react to them. So I'm a pretty logical person as I prefaced earlier. So this method kind of made sense to me. Let me put up this graphic here. Here's some examples of cognitive distortions. One thing that I did was jumping to conclusions, specifically mind reading. You arbitrarily conclude that someone is reacting negatively to you and you don't bother to check this out. That was um, a lot of like social, more like social centered anxiety that I had. Um, but then I also had magnification, catastro ca ca catastro <laughs> oh my god, I can't even say that. Catastrophizing, catastroph, catastrophizing, catastrophizing or minimizing. You exaggerate the importance of things such as your goof up or someone else's achievement where you inappropriately shrink things until they appear tiny. This is also called the binocular trick. Or biggest, mental filter. You pick out a single negative detail and dwell on it exclusively so that your vision of all reality becomes darkened like the drop of ink that colors the entire beaker of water. So that kind of was like my intrusive thoughts. It's like literally consume my entire mentality. The first step is recognizing these cognitive distortions, recognizing which ones they are, because then that's gonna help you figure out how to deal with it. For example, everyone will look down on me. Mind reading, overgeneralization, all or nothing thinking, fortune teller error. So once you've recognized it and determined what type it is, you can come up with a rational response. Someone may be disappointed that I'm late, but it's not the end of the world. Maybe the meeting won't even start on time. That's obviously easier said than done. I was like, okay, I can practice this, right? But I was like, it's easier to just say one thing in my mind than to actually feel it and believe it. So I didn't really understand like how my thoughts necessarily connected to my physical anxiety. Even if I'm not even thinking something negative, I still sometimes feel anxious. Like I'm just sitting in class and the bell's about to ring and I'm like, holy fuck, why do I feel like something is so bad's gonna happen to me right now, you know? but that's kind of where we get into the neurology of it. One thing we know about the body is that it's lazy and it's going to change itself, change its chemicals in order to make something easier. So think about why we build muscle. Every day, if you lift it up 20 pound weight over and over and over, basically what you do at the gym, eventually your muscles are gonna break down and then grow. That 20 pound weight will be easier to lift right? The body's innately lazy. This is the same thing with our mind. When we think these negative thoughts each time, our neural pathways are then designed to think them more easily. Imagine you're on a farm and you're pushing a wheelbarrow and every day you push it, the pathway just gets more outlined. Like if you're hiking and you see like those like bike paths, bike trails or whatever from like bikes constantly running over and over, even if that ground was like dense and you know, not as smooth before. Now it's super smooth because the bikes have gone over it again and again and again. So those pathways now allow those negative thoughts to move more easily through them because it's so repetitive. And the body is like, well, since I think that all the time, I might as well use less energy now to think that. So now those thoughts come with less energy. You do them more quickly. They're more automatic. And now it's kind of like your brain's second nature. Also, when you think negative thoughts, especially things that are really high risk almost like oh i think i just ran over a person because of even a thought your body has a chemical reaction that literally sends it into fight or flight response and it actually thinks that something bad's going to happen to it. it is literally the same chemical reaction as if you were being chased by a tiger out in the wherever tigers live you know like even a thought even if something's not actually happened to you the thought of that happening to you has the same chemical reaction as something actually happening to you and the brain doesn't know how to differentiate the two plus you add on those negative thoughts that sometimes come and it compounds and again deepens those neural pathways strengthens that connection and now it's just easier and suddenly you drop a glass of milk and you're like my fucking life is over because your brain is so used to that repetitive thinking so once i learned that i was like okay wait so you're telling me that even if I'm not even thinking of anything bad, that my body can still go into that fight or flight response because that's what it's used to. And I'm conditioning my body to never feel safe and to always be in a state of high cortisol and high adrenaline and 
looking around the corner every turn. So I learned this and I'm like, wow, that's crazy. So now I'm starting to have a little bit more belief that maybe changing my cognitive distortions, changing my negative self-talk, changing these thoughts is actually going to have an impact on my physical anxiety as well as my mental anxiety. So I go back to the book and I'm taking all these notes, I'm writing down in my notebook and I'm like, okay, sometimes these thoughts that are intrusive are sometimes invalid and crazy and illogical, but sometimes they're real. Like maybe sometimes I would be thinking, hey, this person's now super mad at me because of what I did and maybe it's irrational, but maybe it's true. What if I can't rationalize myself out of a cyclical thought that I keep having over and over? Maybe it is rational, I just can't stop thinking about it, which is still not good. You don't wanna keep cyclically thinking a thought that is negative for you over and over, but what if it's rational? What if it's not, I ran over this random person? What if it's like, my friend's mad at me because like I said her outfit was ugly, you know? Like what if it's rational? I invented a little, not invented, it's probably been invented before, but I added on a little add-on to this. So what I started to do is I decided, okay, let's just say I can't talk myself into the fact that this thought pattern is irrational. What if I think it's completely rational? New plan. I'm going to write down everything be like, okay, so-and-so is mad at me, let's say. Next step, think if there's any cognitive distortions, whatever. If there's not, if you don't think there is, your last step is you're going to say, okay, so now what? So-and-so is mad at me? Okay, maybe. If she reaches out to me or does this and this, then I can apologize or I can apologize up front or I can do this and this. Flesh out all of the solutions to your problem. That way it's a little bit more of a load off your mind because your brain already feels like it has solutions set in place. So it doesn't need to constantly be worrying about what's going to happen if this, what's going to happen if this. Because it's like, well, if this is true, I'm just going to do this. Think about those solutions. I also do this method when my body is so overloaded with emotions that I can't even necessarily decide hey is this a cognitive distortion or not because my mind is such in an unstable headspace that I can't have the logical thought process to say hey maybe this isn't logical so I will do this thing okay you know what fine this is true so what am I gonna do about it back to the cognitive distortions okay let's say I do have a cognitive distortion and it's like everyone hates me even if I realize it's cognitive distortion and I put in the more rational thought behind it, what if I don't actually believe it? I can just say that and be like, okay, well, I know it's not rational, but I'm still gonna feel shitty about it. I'm still gonna feel anxious about it. Back to those neural pathways. Again, when you think a thought consistently, you start to strengthen those neural pathways, strengthen that connection to that thought, and it becomes easier to think and therefore believe that thought. Just on the converse, how it is with the negative. Your brain and body does not know the difference anymore between that event actually happening and you just thinking about it. This is why things like positive affirmations work because you're strengthening those connections in your brain and your brain starts to believe what you're saying. I guarantee you, most likely, that your first attempt at trying to alter your cognitive distortions is not gonna work. I'm sorry, but it's not. You have to literally reconfigure those pathways in your brain something that your brain has been doing for probably weeks or months or years even, decades even, on end and reconfigure them. So yeah, it's not a magic fix all. You're gonna have to work at it. You're not gonna believe it at first, but I will not promise you, but I can almost guarantee you that after enough of that, you will actually start to believe it. This brings us to the coping mechanisms of the physical side. So like I said, I would get in some certain situations where I would literally just be so mentally and physically and like sensorily <laughs> overloaded and I would need some way to like release my anger or like just like built up energy that I had I had so much built up energy I didn't know what to do with so much like because anxiety is just a different form of energy in my head and I had so much built up anxiety energy I didn't know what to do with and I would you know release it in unhealthy ways I was working through this cognitive distortion, changing my self-talk, changing my thoughts, making them more logical process, I still sometimes had those feelings of anxiety. Now we get to the physical side of what to do when you have 
those feelings. You're on your way up, you're working through your cognitive distortions, you know, you're working through your anxiety, but you still kind of feel it. Sleeping more, I'm sorry, but if I sleep for four hours and I wake up and try to go about my day, literally there's like that like nervous, like dirty energy that you have, especially if you chase that with caffeine, which I also did a lot. So I'd sleep for like five hours, busy gal, then I'd, you know, drink coffee or drink an energy drink, whatever, and it would give me that like jittery, dirty, nervous, anxious energy. So I stopped doing that. I started getting at least seven hours of sleep, eight or nine if I could pull it off. And I started doing more clean energy, like teas. Another life hack, again, not medical advice. L-theanine uh, naturally occurs in some tea, but it's an amino acid that basically helps to reduce stress and anxiety levels. If you put L-theanine like in your coffee or something, it kind of reduces that amount of jitteriness. Another thing I did was exercise. That's a really good way to get up that pent up energy and like release that. Or things that are like uncomfortable but still healthy for you, like cold showers or going for a run. Something that puts that physical stress on your body that kind of lets it release that cortisol. I feel like anxiety is just such a hard thing to pinpoint and get in there and kind of fix. But these were the things that I did to help and I can genuinely now say my happiness to like okay if I had to say the ratio of like me either feeling happy or neutral compared to me feeling sad it'd be like nine to one like 90% happy or neutral compared to 10% me feeling like shit um whereas before it was maybe like 80 20 of me feeling like shit and 20% neutral or happy I think sometimes it's unfair of us to be like just gotta pick yourself up by the bootstraps and you know honestly if I didn't have the help of like certain resources and my friends and family like I wouldn't have even known where to begin with this or anything and it is such a long journey that you have to go through at least it was for me I, I want to make more videos like this and maybe I would make more videos delving into certain specifics I talk about in this video. I really enjoy making content like this, so I hope that you guys want to see content like this. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. I will do my best to answer all of them, as I sometimes do. But for now, I'll see you in the next video. Peace.